but in reality, there's seven points that the Coast Guard looks for when they board a boat that might be under a demise agreement. And those seven points, Mr. you want to roll through those or want me to? Sure. Um, but so the seven points, when you, when you look at the, the National Vessel Inspection Circular, uh, talks about the Passenger Safety, uh, Passenger Vessel Safety Act. And so it outlines seven points that everybody needs to be aware of. And those points in brief are, the charter needs to have the option of selecting the crew, because in reality, what we're doing is we're transferring the ownership of the vessel to the charter for the period of the contract. So needless to say, when that happens, he's taking on some liabilities. He needs to be very aware of, of the situation that he's been being put in. And it's a safe thing to do. It's kind of like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not going to do any skydiving soon, but I understand it's fairly safe if you understand the rules and how to do it. So that's what we're here to help with today. But so on, as far as the, um, the selection of crew and, and what the Coast Guard's looking for, the Coast Guard doesn't require that all seven points that, that are outlined in the circular are met and complied with but that most of them are. And in reality, the, the demise agreement has not been approved by the Coast Guard as a legal charter agreement. The, the Coast Guard has left that to the discretion of each district, and it's going to be the district that the boat is chartering in and how they foresee and how they read the contract. I think those of us that uh, live in South Florida or do any charters in South Florida have seen that the, the, I don't know if it's a commandant or who, and that the captain of the port in Miami does not like the demise agreement. And, and doing charters, we basically stopped doing charters in Miami on, on demise agreements because the, the, the Coast Guard has just been stopping stopping the charters, giving them hassles, it's just become a, a more of a liability for everybody, so we've stopped doing Miami. But do, um, when we go through these points, looking at the, the first point, the charter has to have the option of selecting the crew. I think Missy had to explain your, your thoughts as far as why, why a charter should select the crew that's currently on the on the um, the charter does have the right to select the crew and should be know that they have the right to select the crew when you go into this uh, demise contract agreement um, and the relationship between the bare boat and the uh, vessel services agreement. But what is very significant and important is that the crew that is selected or the captain that's selected needs to be approved by the hull provider company to be the captain in charge of the vessel for the time period of the charter. What I explained to my charterers is that they have the right to select a crew, but there does happen to be a crew already on board that's in place and is approved by the hull insurance provider to be in control and command of the vessel for navigation during the time period of the charter. Would you like to hire that captain? If the charterer says no, he would like to bring his own crew, which may come up as a discussion, then I make it, you know, them aware that they will need to send me resumes I'll need to present them to the hull insurance provider because whoever runs the yacht during the charter has to be approved by the hull insurance provider. This is not a Coast Guard regulation. This is a requirement by the hull insurance provider. And this is what keeps the hull insurance intact during the time period of the charter. You don't want to bring a captain on board that isn't approved because that would invalidate the hull insurance for the, that particular charter. I tell them that I would like to see resumes and I would need to present the resume. I don't know if it will be approved or not. If it is tentatively approved, 
Most likely, their captain would be required to go through a training period on board the vessel to be, you know, proved to know that they're knowledgeable to take the vessel out, and it could be anywhere to two to three weeks of training required, depending on the size of the vessel, and um, that would be at the charterer's cost, so that they can do their charter. Now, usually, the when the, this topic comes up, the charter decides to go ahead and take the captain that's already approved by the hull insurance provider. Now, this captain is also the owner's captain. It has stood up in court that the owner's captain can be hired on a vessel services agreement. I think another key point to keep in mind is in reality, the owner is very unlikely to accept a charter where they're not taking this capital. Right? So, so at the end of the day, it's going to be our, you know, the, the captain that is, that is typically with the boat, and it's just the explaining to both your charter and the crew that here's why when the Coast Guard, if the Coast Guard boards, Here's why we have this crew. They, they were already approved by the hull insurer. They're familiar with the boat. They know the systems. We thought it was the wisest choice. So then it goes on <clears throat> to point number two, and that's that the master and crew are paid by the charter. So with the demise agreement, it's a two-part agreement, as most everybody's aware. You have the demise agreement and the vessel services agreement. Vessel Services Agreement is the document wherein the charter hires the crew um, and they, they actually hire the crew as a contractor and then the or hire the captain as a contractor and the contractor then provides the rest of the crew services. <coughs> another, <coughs> excuse me. another thing that's very key to keep in mind is that as far as the insurance goes, the the, the central agents on each boat need to make sure that the contractor is an entity rather than an individual. Anytime a captain is, is personally the contractor, he's taking on a massive amount of liability. Um, he's, he's covering the crew insurance while they're on board and, and a lot more yeah, federal pay, that's Missy saying, federal payroll, it just goes on and on and on. So, so make sure that your, your contractor is, a, is an entity rather than an individual, and the owners should also make sure that every contracting entity is an additional insured on the insurance policy. Otherwise, when the contractor is hired, uh, the, the requirement for the boat and the contractor to provide <coughs> Things such as disability insurance for the crew, which is a requirement, and it will not be uh, in effect unless they're named as an additional insured on the policy. So moving along to point three, all food, fuel, and stores must be provided by the charter. So in that case, all of the APA, your expenses, etc., you want to keep good records on that. Um, the boat, the boat itself, cannot supply any of those things because at this point, it is truly the charter who is has moved over into the position of the owner. Um, moving on to four, all port charges and pilotage fees, if any, are paid by the charter. Uh, again, similar to the point before that, uh, it is the charter's boat at this point for the period of the charter. So all expenses involved with the boat are in effect to the charter's account. Number five, insurance is obtained by the charter at least to the extent of covering liability insurance not included in the owner's insurance. A great indication of full control of the charter is shown if insurance is carried by the charter. So it's it's strongly recommended that, that, you, that you offer um, Charters liability insurance. There's a number of different providers, and I think, Missy, you may have put down a couple of them down here at the bottom. It's two at the bottom. So, so you've got some access there. There's additional uh, companies around that are that are offering it. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. I, 
know we had just done a, a policy the other day that was for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar charter it ran about four thousand um, dollars you would have something similar but right it, it can run it's, you know i've been quoted two thousand dollars on a less expensive charter it, um, it does depend on the amount of the charter now. It used to be that you could buy a, a limit amount, be paid by the million dollar limit that you were purchasing. Now it's based on the amount of the charter as to how much they feel should be in place to cover the value of that charter and anything that might occur on that value charter. Good question, Missy. Um, under five, it's a, uh, the, the second item. Um, no, yeah. Two types of disability insurance. Did you mean liability? No. Um, the Jones Act, which very few people really focus in on, the Jones Act requires any employer of a Marine employee supply two types of disability insurance. And they're specifically identified which types of disability insurance have to be supplied. That means that the crew have to be supplied two types of disability insurance under the Jones Act. Now, because the owner has to supply this as well when the owner is on board and the owner is employing the crew. But when the charterer on the demise contract is employing the crew, the liability for supplying this insurance goes on to the charterer because this insurance is extremely difficult to find for any owner um, to just buy this insurance for their crew separately, Hull insurance providers have built this into the Hull insurance policy. Every, virtually, now this is for American crew, this is not for foreign crew. The Jones Act applies to American crew only, but you know, at any time, you never know on the demise contract that you'll have American crew on board. So, uh, the every health insurance policy has this two types of Jones Act disability insurance required. The health, the insurance is sitting there in the health policy, but there has to be a manner to access it. When the owner is on board and the owner is employing the crew, the hull insurance is in the name of the owner. The owner has every way to, you know, so it's accessible for the crew through the owner. When the, a charterer is on board on the demise contract and they're employing the crew, the only way that that hull insurance, that uh, liability, two types of disability insurance under the Jones Act are available to the crew is if the contractor is listed on the hull insurance policy or the crew policy, or both. However, the owner happens to have it set up so that for sh the contractor can have access. What can happen otherwise is one, your charter is liable for this, so this means that there's a slip and fall and disability insurance is due. The charterer is responsible for supplying it. If the charterer doesn't have access to supply, and I mean, it's sitting right there in the hull insurance policy. So it ought to be made to be available to the charterer so they, to close that liability exposure. But if the charterer doesn't have access through the contractor, by the contractor being named on the whole insurance policy or the crew policy, then the charterer can be sued by the crew and be responsible to pay their disability for however long it's required to do so. And that has happened on demise contracts in the past. I know of at least one incident where the insurance company, even though the insurance was right there in the whole insurance policy, because the contractor on the demise contract was not named on the Hull insurance policy, the insurance, when the charter, when the crew slept and fell on a charter contracted on the demise contract, the insurance company said, no, you have no access to it, you apply to the charterer. And it's not something that you have to do for every individual charter. The contractor can be added as an additional insured to the policy when it first goes into effect and it just left there. <clears throat> yes, it should be. 
that they're just there and you know it. Every charter manager should make sure this is in place. Because also, for every demise contract on the vessel services agreement, the um, contractor is liable for being a signatory on that vessel services agreement. So you also want him to be covered by the liability insurance available in the hull insurance policy in case there's an issue with the vessel services agreement. You want him to be covered with um, uh, insurance to respond legally. And there's also medical insurance. This is for the crew. This is a requirement under the Jones Act that the charter has to supply, but it's nice. And as long as it's sitting right there in the hull insurance, have the contractor also be you know listed, and then they can uh, uh, make available the two types of disability insurance and medical to the crew. Now, also, this gives further proof and support that, in fact, the charter is taking supplying insurance. They do have insurance separate from the owner, even I mean, it's on the owner's policy, but they're the ones accessing it to supply to the crew, um, which is helpful in creating the support for the Coast Guard that, in fact, this charterer is involved with insurance and supplying insurance to the crew and also has been offered charter's legal liability insurance. When the Coast Guard boards, they often ask the charterer, have you been offered charter's legal liability insurance? And you want their answer to be yes. Whether they buy it or not, it doesn't, they want to say yes that they will offer it. It may often, we've seen a lot more contracts coming in now we're right in special conditions. It's said it's being said by the charter by the charter broker that charter liability insurance is highly advised <clears throat> and, and you know you can check with your broker for more information, but they're putting it right in the contract. So it's hard to say it's hard to deny it was offered when it's in the contract. Tom, before we move on, do you have any comments on what's that so far? No, you know, you've been very thorough, which is always appreciated. Um, the underlying theme here for all seven points in the charter agreement in general is control. And when the Coast Guard board has questions, they're going to want to see that control is on the part of the charterer and not on the part of the vessel owner. So all the questions need to be answered as in we're in charge as the charterer. We're in charge. We're doing this. This is all our behest. It was from the provisioning. We've got our insurance, uh, whether they're additional insured on the whole policy or however that may be handled. Um, you know, it's all got to be about control. So, great. Well, then we'll move on to uh, item number six, and that is that the charter may discharge for cause the master or any crew member without referral to the owner. So interesting spot there. I've never never run into that. Not quite sure how it would be handled. Have you ever seen it happen? I, I never have. But if it were ha that way and the, that happened on board a charter that I have in place, the first thing I would tell them is, I'm sorry, but you may have invalidated the hull insurance policy until we get a captain back on board that's been approved by the hull insurance provider to move this yacht one foot and therefore your charter stops you you know it's not a question of the coast guard yes you could have you can um, fire that captain but it's a question of the hull insurance provider and this charter will stop and not move a foot until and this yacht will not move a foot until there's somebody back on board that is approved by the hull insurance provider to operate this vessel that would be my response yeah. but it would, that wouldn't be the case if they kicked off a, a you know, naughty deckhand or stew or something. I, that, that, right. Yeah. Right. We're talking about if they kick the case yeah. off. Yeah. Right. Great. Then moving along to, point, I, I think one more thing to keep in mind here is, again, we don't have to comply with 100% with all seven points. You've got to comply with, quote unquote, most. So I don't think I'd be going into a real long discussion with my charter that if you don't like what the captain's telling you, you can fire him. It's uh, I think, yeah. you know, I think we need to be a little cautious with that one. 
And that's important. It's a weighted test. It's not an all or nothing test. So it is a weighted test. Uh, when look at this. Uh, number seven, the vessel is to be surveyed on its delivery and return. And that's a part of the contract that, that is already written into the demise agreement. Um, it was it was interesting. We had a, a situation a couple of months ago where the charterer decided to do an addendum where he asked the contractor who was going to be in his employ to do the survey before he got to the boat and when he left. And so he transferred, I believe he transferred that liability over to, or that responsibility over to the contractor at that point. Do you agree? I do. Yes. So, you know, I don't think too many of our clients are getting to the dock, jumping in the water, taking a look at the props, et cetera, et cetera, going through the villages and so forth and doing a survey. But um, in reality, though, he has that, that responsibility in the contract and it can be switched over to, to the contract. That's correct. And if the charter are asked to do a survey before and after, they have the right to do it, so it can't be no. So those are the seven main points. I think at this point, we'll open it up to questions. If we... So the survey is mandatory? No, it's one of, no, no. It's just one of the seven points that you want to have a majority of in place to um, support the idea that this is truly a demise contract charter. I just wonder, all these boats, on the West Coast, we almost never use this contract. Because um, when a boat comes to us for charter, we say get the mayor and waiver. But that does not seem to work in Florida. What percentage of boats in based in Florida could get the mayor and waiver if they wanted to? It's not a question of the Merritt waiver. It's a question of more of foreign flag duty paid imported in, I think, on the yes, East Coast. And those vessels only get the right to recreation, and they have to charter on the demise contract no matter what. But the Merritt waiver. Is doing it too. What, the Merritt waiver, a number of yachts on the East Coast have, and we're. If a yacht can get the Marath waiver and be set up with the right American crew and uh, be on the uninspected passenger vessel, that's always the very best thing to do. There's absolutely no shade of gray. The Coast Guard accepts and I approves that contract. The, uh, tax thing in Florida uh, it costs the owner more in taxes. I think that's a whole tax. I think that's a whole tax situation on purchase if they get registered commercial or private pleasure, and that is an owner's choice. But um, I, I think all of us would prefer to see any vessel that can be on the uninspected passenger vessel contract, but not every owner is making that choice. I was surprised that the number at the beginning you gave seventeen. Yeah, I I would say I do 75% of my contracts in New England are demise contracts. Oh, yeah. Most of them are because the vessel cannot get the Marat waiver or um, the boat is foreign flag duty paid imported in. So on our coast, they're almost 100% with waivers or U.S. flag. flag are, yeah, it's just a different U.S. flag. Uh -huh. Right, I think we have a bigger on the East Coast because they're coming over from Europe. Yeah. And, uh, and then they're coming to New England as a unique cruising area that uh, we have more foreign, pay, foreign flag duty pay. I did one in Canada where a motor yacht hit the deadhead under the water and the deductible of the insurance was $45,000. And this was way back when, before we got them. <laughs> and um, they really named part of my client to pay the forty-five thousand dollars deductible. We've written the, the boat, we've written the AYCA agreement so that the charterer is not responsible yeah. for the deductible, and that will stay in the updated version as well. It's not exactly the way the Coast Guard wants to see it, 
But again, not all seven points have to be in place. So we're just judiciously choosing as well on that contract as to um, certain things that we're choosing um, with attorney's <laughs> advice to keep in the contract such as the charter is not responsible for the deductible on the demise contract. It's also been said that a lot of your charters may have a, um, a umbrella policy, a personal umbrella policy that would cover that charter's liability, that the, the liability that he might have in that instance for deductible. But I think putting that at risk versus what the cost of the charter's liability insurance is, is, is pretty minimal on the, on the cost. So, And if I could just add in there, if people do have umbrella policies, but you, they have to buy charter's legal liability insurance as a basis for their umbrella policy to be attached to. There has to be a marine policy in place of liability insurance before anybody's personal umbrella insurance can be attached. But I have done that with people's risk managers where they bought the base insurance, charter's legal liability insurance policy then attached, you know, a 20 million personal umbrella to it. But you have to work with the clients risk manager and the insurance companies to do that. I think another point that you were discussing with me yesterday that I I was not aware of was that the Coast Guard in most every case will not consider the demise agreement a legal contract on day charters. Most in most instances they have I know uh, up here in Newport we um, in the night late 1990s, we had quite a number of boardings and we sat down. The best thing to do if a captain of the port, they rotate every three years, usually, and each captain of the port has the right to interpret the shade of gray of the demise contract the way they would like to. And the only way to um, appeal is to take the captain of the port to, to court and try to prove that you're right, that you have the right to do a demise contract, that's quite costly and you know takes a long time. So the best thing to do, if the captain of the port has rotated in, like there seems to be a new one in Miami, and he's chosen to decide that the demise contract is not a, a legal venue or necessarily evil, is to sit down with that captain of the port and ask him. In some instances, many instances, the Coast Guard feels that the demise contract is not a legal contract for a day charter. They feel that the charterer has not been offered the choice of crew, but more importantly, they feel that the day, char the day charterer has not been offered charter's legal liability insurance hasn't had the time to purchase charter's legal liability insurance, and they feel that the day charterer is not being sold properly on the, what his liabilities are for being in the demise contract, which is that they are liable for the vessel as a bare boat charter, and they're liable for employing the crew. That means if there's a lawsuit that the charterer can be named both as a bare boat charterer of the vessel and be named as the employer of the crew. So they can be named twice in um, their, this contract interest, usually in this contract arrangement. And what the Coast Guard feels is that you've got this demise contract to day charter. Well, right beside that yacht, could be an unexpected passenger vessel where the owner supplies the crew and the charterer has virtually no liability. So why is this charterer taking this day charter on the demise contract when they could step right on board in an unexpected passenger vessel or on an inspected passenger vessel? So the contract, the charter, the house guard feels that this is not being fair to the public to put this demise contract option out there because they're probably not being sold properly when they do have the option of going on a day charter on an inspected vessel or an uninspected passenger vessel. Here in um, the Newport area, we sat down with the captain of the port in the 1990s when they were boarding 
everywhere. And that's exactly what they told us, was no day charters, overnight charters. We'd like to see them, you know, three, four days or longer. We feel that you've done the selling process, but we also want to see a correct demise contract arrangement. So if we do board, we see as many of those seven points in place as possible. And um, so we stopped doing demise contracts on day charters. And I haven't done a demise contract on a day charter since 1995. What do you use? I don't do it. Don't do them. I don't do it. <laughs> That's a good solution. Right. I only put clients on uh, uninspected or passenger. I mean, or, or in, inspected. So we feel probably that, you know, I, I think the captain of the port in Miami, we don't know whether he's just against the demise contract for all charters. That was the case in St. Thomas about, I don't know, six years ago. And again, people in our industry sat down with the captain of the port and found out. And the captain of the port said, no demise contract. I don't want to see any demise contracts, even on a week-long charter. They're not legal. And I'm going to take action. And I'm going to check. And if I see a demise contract, then I'm going to fine and, and, do, and penalize. So we just didn't do demise contracts pickups on charters in St. Thomas. It's, you know, you, you find out what the captain of the port's thinking, and then you comply with what he's telling you that his thought process is on the demise contract, because it is a shade of gray. He does have the right to do this, and your only option is to go to court. Next question. How's the port captain in Rhode Island? We haven't had any issues recently. Uh, in the New York Marine Safety District, there were boardings um, last summer. They may continue this summer for specifically looking for the demise contract being used on day charters. Specifically looking for that. So we just need to be aware and um, do your best at keeping your client um, comfortable and th there's always the choice not to, you know, to tell, you know, if the client's concerned about it, that he has to take a vessel that's an unexpected passenger vessel. But as we know, there are some yachts that will never comply with that contract. Besides the Marriott, what else? I mean, is that how they comply? Just that? No, no, foreign flag, duty paid, imported in, will never have the rights to, um, uninspected passenger vessel. They will always only have the rights to recreation. That, unfortunately, is is because of the Jones Act, right? Yes. yes. And the Jones Act, which many, many people would love to dismantle, yeah. is impossible to dismantle and um, touch any part of it because there's a, um, a longshoreman has a very, very, in New Jersey, have a very, very strong lobbyist in Washington, and they have been fighting for years to keep every aspect of the Jones Act in place, even those that are disruptive, basically, um, to American commerce. And uh, because they feel if any aspect of that Jones Act is touched, then ultimately they may lose their two types of Jones Act disability insurance and everything else that's in there for the longshoremen as, as marine employees. That comes up every couple of years. There's an article in some of the publications we get at the office that they're going to challenge the Jones Act on X, Y, or Z points, and it never goes anywhere. So, <laughs> and you just laugh, right? <laughs> yeah, we just say, yeah, well, let's see what's going to happen here, you know? <laughs> never really comes to a head. So. No. Yeah, when the IYBA was going for their deferred importation um, to to allow boats to be offered for non-U.S. flag boats or duty paid boats to be offered for sale here in the U.S., there was talk about seeing if we could also get charter tied in with that and get those boats in on charter. And the lobbyists came down and, and it was oil and gas I mean, it's, it ends up being lobbyists from so many different industries that you just couldn't touch it. It was, it was just way too onerous. 
Anything else? And just a, a, on the MANRAD waiver, the vessel has to be more than three years old. So if it's not three years old, they, can, they cannot um, get the MARAD waiver because that's protecting American boat builders. If it's more than three years old, the um, application should go in. It takes, um, there's a 60 day period where the application has to be put out to public comment. But it, it's done in about three months and um, costs about $300 to do. The one thing is, is that if you're going for the Manorad waiver, you never want to ask to have Alaska included. There's, I mean, we wish this wasn't the case, but there is somebody in Alaska who is protecting American laid hull vessels in Alaska operating for charter. He will object, he watches every Manorad waiver that goes in, every comment period, and he objects to every vessel that they ask for merit waiver for last month. Yeah, you know, he has been, and he, you're right. It's been about, no one can live forever. Yeah, it's been at least 15, 20 years he's been yeah. doing this. So. Okay, for some of the newer brokers here, could you just do a brief review of what the merit waiver is and why we like it? Yes, the Marad waiver gives a vessel that is a foreign laid hull, American flag, the rights to coastwise trade. So it waives the foreign laid hull issue. Because you know for coastwise trade, to automatically get coastwise trade, the vessel has to be an American laid hull. So it's adopted, you're being right. adopted by America. And we have very few American boat builders left. So. I mean, this was all, again, part of the Jones Act and part of just protecting American boat builders at the time when there were a lot of American boat builders, but we just don't have that many left. So most, yeah, so most charter yachts are, um, many of them are not American laid hull. And they need the merit waiver. Okay. Did you have a question? Just a quick question. I want to circle back to the survey. You know, it's so a point that has to be included. But do you always have a right addendum in the charter? What's the, you never happen to do the survey? Or can you just kind of communicate that? I, I want it in writing. Okay. You know, because you are, you're subrogating your right and liability to somebody else. And I think, I think, even if you were to just simply put it in special conditions, um, which which you can put in just on the vessel services agreement, that, that the captain, the, the contractor would take on that that liability. I think that would cover you, and I think it it also is is a great step to proving that you you handled one of the seven steps. Exactly, it would it would be more evidence. Yes. Right. In writing, just like having keeping the receipts and having the provisioning form in in hard copy or on a computer hard drive on board, it all provides evidence that in fact you're complying with the seven points. You know, there's a great number of the, I think three or four points can actually be added into special conditions in writing, and you you handle them clearly. And then you've started to get that weighted scale moving in your favor, and there may be a couple other points that a that a Coast Guard agent is going to to have to ask some questions. But if you've got them in the contract, it's clear, it's been signed, it's been read, it's gone through, it's been, uh, it's been gone through. So, do you have comments to make? No, I, you know, it, it's, you, you've covered everything pretty well, especially on the seven points of uh, this particular agreement. Um, but the special conditions, uh, you know, that's uh, the ideal place to try to reinforce this control theme that I've mentioned before and that we've been talking about on the panel. Um, you know, the special conditions can be just about anything. So, you know, if you need it to be in writing and you want to make sure that you got the charter signature on that, that's the place to put it. Um, yeah, other than that, no, I don't have any specific comments. I'm open for questions, obviously. I mean, most of my job is attacking these things or defending these things instead of uh, kind of coaching on them, if you will. Um, but 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm available to speak about anything you'd like to, or if you have any questions. And tomorrow you're going to be paying about 600 bucks an hour, so here it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Hey, um, um, I have yes. a question. So when we're paying the owners, <clears throat> and we have two corporations, one for the crew mates agency and one for the actual owner of that, should we be actually paying separately? Separate entities. Right. That's the importance of the separate entities. Um, you know, and, and, and realize that, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, it's really shocking. I mean, there's one person that owns both entities. Correct. It, it's really kind of the same thing. Like, and, like right now, like with most of the boats, if they have the two corporations, then we're set to pay the APA to yeah. the crewing agency, um, but not the actual owner net in the, in the, in the Right. And, and, you know, ideally, the two entities should also have a, a separate um, home base, if you will, separate phone number, separate address, that kind of thing, even if it's a P.O. box. Right. Uh, because if you want to pierce that corporate veil, which the Coast Guard won't literally try to pierce the corporate veil and show that the behaviors are actually just one and the same, um, you can avoid that if those entities are set up properly. Well, look, but offer for selling the book that they're trying to turn and you know handling that paperwork should try to do that before it gets to us as the charter managers absolutely instead of having to fix it later no absolutely yes yeah, so they should and hopefully they'll advise the um owner to put the contractor on the health right. insurance policy right yeah, that's great but i have seen um the coast guard try to pierce the corporate shell and they've even gone to look at stock certificates I mean, right now, I'm seeing so. corporations, two corporations that are almost like almost identical with the, the names, like you know. That's yeah, it's pretty. <laughs> playing it a little too close, to, um, yeah. But you know, for my comfort. Right. And what, 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 name of boat crew services is what we see so often. Is yeah, mm -hmm. right. Busy. Um, it'd be great if you had, if you don't already have that piece of paper um, somewhere, or mail it off to membership. Email I me. Mean. Yeah, it'll go on, the, on, on, the, on the website. It'll be on the website. Good information. Yeah, another point, Missy, we might have been discussing. When you're talking to a client, when you're offering a boat to a client, and you have to be uh, sure that they know that this is a demise contract, there is that wonderful letter that sort of states you've chartered this lovely yacht, and the points that you need to make so the charterer is aware that is different. You're not just going on a boat and you have no liability. You have to be clear. Yes, the three things that's that our responsibility. Coast Guard really wants to see that the charterer is aware of is one, is increased liability on this agreement when he could choose an unexpected passenger vessel instead. They want to make sure that the public is not being not taken unawares. Yeah. It's really to protect the public is what they say this is all about. So they want to make sure that you're, because it is, your charterer is the public, that the charterer is making a informed choice when they charter this vessel on the demise contract that they know they have increased liability versus offering them a yacht on the uninspected passenger vessel uh, contract, but they've cho chosen to go ahead with the increased liability because they want this particular yacht. They also want to know that the charter has been offered the charter's legal liability insurance to cover this increased liability. The charter's legal liability insurance policy has been written to dovetail exactly into every increased life I've been told now don't take my word you know I'm not an insurance agent but um, to dovetail into every exposure on the demise contract for the charterer this policy responds only to the charterer but it dovetails into every um, exposure on both the bare boat and the vessel services agreement so it's the one policy that covers both and the Third item is choice of crew. Why did you choose this captain? And that answer, a good answer, it doesn't have to be everybody's, but a good answer is because the captain's approved by the Hull Insurance Policy. 
to operate this vessel. Where, what insurance agency would you recommend that Right, and, and we have now found, I, I, I had trouble. This winter, it was hard. We had to go on a search to find new providers. There are two listed at the bottom of this um, flyer, but there are also other companies. There's MGA, M MHG, that's also got that trip cancellation insurance policy that includes COVID. No, she's retired. No, she's not. I work with her on a pet charter working with her now. Yeah, I just reported to I'm working. You. She's responding to me now. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Says Gil Carroll. Gil Carroll. And, uh, but Brown and Brown is no longer doing it. So, Triton doesn't do it anymore either. No. And I don't think Marsh does it. Unless there's any other questions, we'll hand it back to Neil.